Please. So, hi everyone, good afternoon. So, as Federico said, this presentation will be basically about space and time, not exactly about linguistics. So, I'm an, a social anthropologist, not a linguist, but this is going to be almost like physics. So, be ready for that. <laughs> so, it's a pleasure to be here. So, I'm really grateful that I was invited to come here to make this presentation. As Federico said, this is one of the first outcomes of my fieldwork. And <coughs> so, thanks for the University of Amsterdam for this invitation. And thanks, Federico, for all the help you gave me and still give me. So, um, how many of you know something about Scrambo? Good, so we are comfortable here. Uh, I just, I'm just going to present it very briefly to give you an overview of this community of Esperanto speakers and Esperanto supporters throughout time. So, the, as you know, this is like an, an artificial language. This is a contested term, of course, but we could <laughs> say so to make it easier now. So, the fundamentals of the language were launched in 1887. And <coughs> after that, there was like a community of speakers that arose from this. And this profile of the support of Peranto has changed throughout time. And in the beginning, it was known as the language of Jews, because it was created by a Jew. And the first supporters, some of them were linked to it, more or less. And that was the stereotype people had of Peranto. And later, things were getting complex with other groups that also support Esperanto, because at some point it gained its supporters in Western Europe, and people from France, more, most of them, <coughs> were intellectuals and uh, bourgeoisie. And later there were also communists and pacifists and anti-fascists during the times of the First World War and thereafter, and also leftists in general. And nowadays there are many people who support Esperanto simply because they like language in general. They are polyglots. So they speak Esperanto, and Esperanto is only one language among many others for them. And also many people use Esperanto to bridge natural and cultural differences. Because there is this whole idea about Esperanto not belonging to any specific community. It's not an ethnic language, it's not a national language. So it can be no one's language and everyone's language at the same time. So the, this idea of what they call neutrality also is something that is quite important for Esperanto speakers and one reason why so many people support it. And later I'm going to talk about this political program linked to Esperanto, which is also somehow linked to this idea of political neutrality and ethnic neutrality. <coughs> so, uh, as I said, it's going to be a conference about time and space, basically, and how Esperanto speakers conceptualize and engage with these definitions and these ideas in their everyday enactments of esperanto if we can call so. So, many Esperantists see Esperanto as a project oriented towards the future, because if Esperanto is supposed to be somehow the international language, the, the universal language, at some point everyone is supposed to speak it as a more general idea that not many of them would still hold this idea in practice, but this would be one of the reasons to support Esperanto. And other Esperanto speakers also regret that Esperanto still didn't become this uh, that widespread. So I'm going to ask Federico to yeah. give you this leaflet. Yeah, yeah. So I brought two quotes from my field work in France, and I wanted you to have a look at them. At the first one, no. <coughs> I'm going to talk about my methodology in one minute. I just wanted you to read this first.
So one, I, one of the questions I was asked before starting my fieldwork in my anthropology department in the UK was, how can you study ideas of hope among people who are hopeless about the cause they support? And this first quote really illustrates this idea. <coughs> so how to push forward a cause that is considered to be doomed? If nobody speaks Trump, if nobody cares about this language, why do these people insist on trying to speak it, on trying to promote it at all costs? And that was the question that a non Sperantal speaker asked me before the start of my research. And I ended up realizing that this was also a question among Sperantal speakers in general. <coughs> so, if Sperantal has no hope ahead, how can we still consider it as the language of hope? And to try to answer this question, maybe not to answer, but just to address it somehow, to try to understand people's perspectives behind this kind of reasoning. I decided to do field work as part of my research. That, that was the main part of my research, we can say so. And then I do, did this through this ethnographic approach. And I chose to do my field work in France and in the Netherlands because of the experimental associations in these places. So these associations of Sperranto speakers are considered to be the centers of the institutionalized Sperranto movement. So those who want to promote the language, who engage, who want to engage with other Sperranto speakers to practice the language, to hold debates, to somehow get in touch with the language, usually do this through these associations. So in the early days of Sperranto, they really needed those associations because of the means of communication at that time, in the late 19th century. So basically, they spoke a language, but they didn't have anyone around them to speak the language with. So they, some of these early Esperanto speakers went to these associations to try to find books, to try to find other Esperanto speakers, to try to make a real use of the language. So this was where everything began, let's say. <coughs> So in part of my ethnographic approach included interviews and researches in archives and I stayed in France, in Paris, during one year to study these associations there and then in the Netherlands, in Rotterdam, during one month and I also attended some international Esperanto congresses. So I went to Slovakia in 2016 for the Universal Congress of Esperanto. So this congress is held once a year and 2016 it was in Slovakia, last year it was in South Korea, I attended both and I also attended French Toronto Congresses because they also host these national congresses. So basically associations and congresses are the formal institutions through which Toronto speakers meet each other historically. Nowadays we have another mediators to enable this communication but in the beginning this was the center of the, the movement if you could say and also of the community. So in France, we have some of these associations where it's the Universal Esperanto Association whose headquarters is in Rotterdam and that's why it is part of my research there. And in France, we have these associations. What did they do? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> okay. And so there's this difference. I'm not going to talk too much about this today, but there's this difference between the workers' Esperanto movement and the neutral Esperanto movement. Some of them try to promote uh, social causes through Esperanto, to talk about communism, anarchism, and social and political engagements in general through the use of this language. And other people try to promote the language without being linked to political causes specifically. So uh, these are just the names of the associations. You do, we don't need to go further at this now. But that's where I started my, my research, my field research. So I chose the associations as the, st the starting point and from them I tried to engage with Sperantal speakers in other environments because there's also a group of young Sperantal speakers in Paris, for example. They are not members of associations, but still they exist and they meet, they meet elsewhere in restaurants, in the streets, in every other place, and, but not in the association. So, uh, as I said, historically, the associations are both, we could say, the bridges and the anchors of the Esperanto movement, mainly in its early days. So, in the beginning, being an active Esperanto speaker meant being part of an association. 
that was the only way to receive a list of addresses of others from the speakers so as we could write letters to them and then meet them in these conferences and know about these conferences through the information that came from these associations. Nowadays, pe people don't really rely in these associations to have this information anymore. We have the internet and all this stuff. So, but the associations were the anchor of the Esperanto movement in the sense of controlling movements and at the same time, in some cases, in the sense of preventing these movements. So, they organized the Esperanto movement and sometimes they also made it difficult for Esperanto to go in certain directions. <coughs> So, uh, as you could read in this first quote, many people in these associations are hopeless about the future of Esperanto because they see that associations have been losing members, that people don't really care about associations anymore. People don't usually take Esperanto courses in these associations. People can learn Esperanto online, for example. They don't need to go there to a face-to-face -face class in a classroom to learn this. So, uh, and some of these people only engage with Esperanto in this association framework. So, some of them, of course, they don't have money to attend international congresses. They simply don't have time to travel all the time. They have families, <coughs> they have careers, they have to take care of many other things and they can't simply be a cosmopolitan in practice all the time. So, they learn a language, and for example, in France, many of these people learn Esperanto, but only speak Esperanto with native speakers of French and sometimes it's weird for them as they also say because they use a language with people who speak the same mother tongue and they could as well be speaking French and it wouldn't be any problem for them so if these people think the associations are coming to an end because of this decreasing membership because they don't have magazines anymore because they don't hold regular congresses can we still have hope about Sperando? So, if the association is about to come to an end, what does it mean? Does it mean that Esperanto is hopeless or the association is hopeless? What does it mean to be hopeless in this situation, for example? And if they are hopeless, why do they still support the association? Why do they still engage with Esperanto? So, this is showing the membership in Esperanto funds. The Esperanto funds is the French branch of WEA, the, the Universal Esperanto Association. So, this Universal Esperanto Association in Rotterdam, they have national branches in many countries and Esperanto Plus is the national branch in France. So, it was created, this association, in 1898 and until 2010 you can see how many members they have nowadays. So, someone who has been going to the association since this time here, for example, in this moment they will see that there is no one interested in Esperanto anymore. And they keep saying, most of our members are old people. Someday they are going to die. Doesn't mean the language is going to die. Because Esperanto is usually not transmitted from one generation to the other. Of course, there are families who use Esperanto at home, as a home language. And they teach Esperanto to their children. And their children are raised in this Esperanto environment. But we could say they are a minority. So, that's not the way the language is transmitted. If there aren't people coming to this association anymore, and the only approach I have to Esperanto, for example, is through associations. Does it mean that the whole project is about to collapse? <coughs> and then this is, so what is Esperanto all about, after all? If we are going to associations just to speak a weird language with people who has the same mother tongue as me, what's the point of speaking this language in practice? So this was on one of the first postcards like, uh, created in Esperanto and it was supposed to have many addresses of many different people because this was the way the early Esperanto speakers knew that there were other people in the world speaking this language so basically the first person who had this postcard could write his or her name here and with the address and send it to other person and the other person also received this and sent to another one so you can see the whole movement started in Chile and then it went to Russia, Russia, and then Czech Republic, or Czechoslovakia at the time, and then Hungary, and then <coughs> so, United States. So they could see things circulating. They could, think, could see that even if them couldn't go abroad to meet another Esperanto speaker from another language background, 
they put circulates indirectly through these things, through postcards, through books. So it's a way of approaching cosmopolitanism if you are somehow entrapped. So many of these people were trapped in the sense of not having money, of not having time to attend these international congresses. So if they can circulate themselves, they made something else circulate on their behalf. And they could see that this community really existed somehow, even if they couldn't contact these people in person, in face to face relations. And you can also see by the early advertisements of Speranto. So this is another postcard connected to Speranto. And then you can see that Speranto is some sort of god who is going to connect all the peoples from different oranges. You see indigenous peoples and British people and I don't know, French and the savages here. So Speranto is going to be the, always the bridge. There's always this idea of Speranto connecting people, bridging differences and bringing peoples together. So it's going to be the language that's going to enable this international communication at all levels with a language that doesn't belong to any specific country or any specific ethnic group. So it's all about circulating, traveling, meeting and learning with difference, engaging with the cultural order. So that's what makes sense of this whole project. But as I said, there are these people who never had this experience because they never travel abroad, they never leave the associations in which they work in which they engage with Speranto. And this is another advertisement, another postcard, and you see also children from different origins just gathering together around the world, embracing the world, embracing cultural difference, and showing that Speranto is there for this reason. And also, <coughs> a stamp, also to promote Speranto, as you can see, always postcards, always stamps, the early in the early days of Toronto, the way of making things circulate was through these postal services, who were also created in the late 19th century. So, Esperanto as a code of communication has always been linked to means of communication at each time. So, in at this time, they used postcards and letters. Nowadays, we can use emails, so online social networks. So, Esperanto is being adapted to each situation, each circumstance. And this is made by the workers in Esperanto movement to promote Esperanto among the workers, <coughs> as you can see properly. So Esperanto is going to be, it says in French, it's going to be the, the language that would destroy the barriers among workers. So workers of the world unite, okay, let's get it together, but once we are together we can't understand each other, so we have to use this language. Because it's not fair for a worker to learn French or English because that language would be too difficult for people who didn't have like a formal approach to, the, to education, for example. So Esperanto is easier to be learned, so that's why it would be suitable for workers, for example. So as I said, associations are the places from where the movement begins. And then I'm talking about movement in two senses here. It can be either the social movement, so association would be the place where these <coughs> advertisements are produced, where people gather together to think about strategies to promote Esperanto, where people uh, hold stalls in events, in fairs to promote Esperanto to people who didn't know about it before, for example. And also movement in terms of circulation, because this is where people know about other Esperanto speakers in other countries. That's how they engage with this difference internationally, let's say. <coughs> so, from the associations, there is this pessimist view, as I showed you in the, this quote, <coughs> the community is shrinking. So, if the association has been losing members, it means nobody cares about Esperanto anymore. And according to this perspective, Esperanto is always presented as something that is trapped between the future and the past. So, in the past, Esperanto was glorious and it was a project full of hope with people interested in engaging with the other, in learning this language, in being part of this international community, in going beyond national borders and language barriers to meet the other, the cultural other. So in the past, it all, it, this whole thing worked perfectly. But nowadays, nothing works, but still Esperanto is oriented towards the future, uh, to one day when people will really recognize that Esperanto is a valuable project to be supported. So for these people who keep promoting all the time, Esperanto is always there in the future or in the past, in hopeless 
perspectives about the future and nostalgic views about the past, but it's never here and now. It's never in the present. And that's why they have this pessimistic perspective. So just to give you an idea about how an instrument association looks like, this is the headquarters of the of Spion de France, the French branch of UER is in Paris, in the fourth district of Paris. So basically they they come here to learn the language and they have every week they have a meeting to debate about a specific topic in Esperanto. So this is both a way of practicing the language and also to socialize. So Esperanto grew as a network of friends, let's say. They meet here to practice the language, to talk about other topics, to learn something new and to engage with each other. And associations in France are specifically important because since the, there, there is a law from 1901, which is the law of associations, and it says that French people can uh, freely associate and create this institutionalized framework to hold meetings about any topic they want to talk about. <coughs> if they want to create a social movement, uh, an association, a club, or something like this, they are free to do that thanks to this law. And this law, in the French mindset, is completely connected to ideas about freedom of expression. So I can express myself freely because I'm a member of this association to talk about, for example, animal rights. So, if I'm not a member of this association, it means that maybe, historically, of course, not nowadays, it means that maybe I cannot be free to talk about this because I won't be able to find another environment in which this topic would be considered relevant or feasible. So, associations in France are deeply connected with ideas of freedom of expression, and having an association, being a member of associations, is something very important. So, if an association is collapsing, it means that this is a serious problem. So something really wrong is going on in Esperanto, we have to do something. <coughs> so and this is one of the stalls to announce Esperanto in a, in a fair in Paris, Paris. So this is the forum of associations from the fourth district. And then I was talking to Nicole, this is a pseudonym, I'm not using real name here. And she was one of the volunteers in Esperanto France. And we went together to the sphere to promote Esperanto, and I was there as part of my field work, of course. And that's what she told me. Young people in general never heard about Esperanto. When it comes to older people, when I talk about Esperanto to them, they usually react by saying, oh, Esperanto, that failed language project. So this is an idea held by many people in Paris, many of these volunteers in the associations. So they are very often hopeless about what they're doing, but still they keep trying to promote the language. And we can play with this idea of uh, stability and stagnation. Because, as they always say, and we have like a, an, a saying like this in the UK, you, we have to sprint to stand still. So we are always in the same position because we can't move forward. But at the same time, we have to keep running to stay in the same position because the whole world is coming against us. So they keep making efforts to stay in the same position. And at the same time, they s can see that these efforts are not working, but because they keep losing members. So how to be hopeful in this scenario? How to support the language of hope if you are not hopeful anymore? <coughs> so, uh, as I said, historically associations were the anchors of the movement and the bridges, but nowadays there are some social networks. And this Amikumo is like an app for smartphones through which you can locate speakers of specific languages by using your GPS. So basically, many Esperanto speakers use this <laughs> to meet each other. So for example, if I come to Amsterdam and I came here yesterday, I can simply check this app. If I have nothing else to do, if I want to meet with fellow speakers, I can simply look for them. So this is something that is creating a different dynamics in this community. And of course, these people who use Facebook, who use Twitter, who use Amikum, they don't engage with Esperanto through associations. They are not in this association environment. So these people who only use Esperanto in associations, usually older people, they don't see this kind of thing going on. So uh, then we go back to this idea that Nicole told me in this forum in Paris. 
Uh, they don't see young people who know about Spelunky. Young people don't care about Spelunky anymore. It means we are gone. Nobody wants to speak the language I speak. But actually these people exist, but they are elsewhere. They are not in associations. In Paris, there is also this association for young Spelunky speakers, which is also linked to Spelunky fans. But young people usually, they are not members of this. They know this association exists, but they don't want to go to the same room every week in a regular moment to have these forum meetings. So today we are going to talk about the Netherlands. Tomorrow we are going to talk about uh, nuclear energy. They are not really interested in this. They want something more dynamic. They meet in restaurants, they go to parties together, they hold meetings in their places and invite the others to come. So they are not in this association framework. And actually, these kind of things kind of forming different communities according to age groups. So I would like to ask you to read the second quote in this paper, David. So, this quote comes from a, pu a couple who live in the poorest region of France, it's not in Paris. This is next to La Rochelle, but in a small town. I'm not sure if you know France, but still, it's in the west coast. Uh, <coughs> so, these people, as you can clearly see, they are not working in an association, they are not volunteers, they are not promoting Sprint. They are just using it for the fun of it, because they want to meet people from other backgrounds. So they found out about this language, they decided, oh, why not, it seems to be interesting. And then they realized they could make friends in other countries because of Spiran. And it was part of their idea of changing their lifestyle. So for them, Spiran is seen as an alternative, as a life-changing experience, as a different way of engaging with the culture of others. So before that, they didn't travel abroad very often simply because they are too talkative, too enthusiastic about things in general, and they didn't want to be tourists. They don't want to go abroad and stay in a hotel and just go to sightseeing. They wanted to do something else, to talk to the local population, and they didn't want to be random and simply approach people in the streets and say, hi, I'm a foreigner, I want to talk about you. So they wanted to engage with the local population, but in a different way. And Esperanto was the thing that enabled them to do that. Of course, they could do it otherwise, through other tools, through other ways. But they chose to do it through Sperando. And uh, they also mentioned that they quit smoking because of Sperando. Because be before they smoked all the time, and they decided that they didn't have money to do other things. So they simply stopped it by cigarettes because they wanted to save money to travel abroad. And they... Sorry, I'm telling you, I forgot one. So basically, Esperanto was the tool that enabled them to have these different experiences and to go abroad and to meet people. So Esperanto for them is something that is clearly situated in the present. They don't really care about the future or the past of Esperanto. They kept saying, so even if Esperanto dies someday, I speak it. So, so what? What's the problem? <laughs> if Esperanto dies tomorrow, according to them, they made so much in their lives thanks to Esperanto that they wouldn't really regret it, as they kept saying. So, uh, for them, Esperanto is something that makes loops, that enables you to have an opportunity to go abroad, to meet people, to engage with difference. So, uh, it's not about promoting Esperanto all the time, it's about living this experience. So, in this sense, it's a very liberal project, because Esperantists usually don't want, don't try to push Esperanto to be an official language in a specific country, for example. They, these people just want to use the language to practice. And they would like you or other people, like persons, to speak the language. But they don't really care about promoting to a whole community, for example, or to create an Esperanto city, let's say. 
of course, these claims exist amongst French speakers, but this is not the, the tradition, if we could say so. So, for these people, temporality is taken for granted. They don't really care about the future. They don't really talk about the past, the glorious past of Sopranto. They are not hopeless about the future because they can see it working now. If you go to international congresses, you will see that there are so many young people there. If you go to other countries and meet Sopranto speakers in these other places, for example, if I come here, I'm completely lost, and I get in touch with local Sopranto speakers, probably one of them, or maybe some, would come to help me to go with me to a walking tour around Amsterdam and all these things. So, they can do something out of Esperanto apart from promoting it for the sake of promoting it. And then <coughs> it brings us to this guy, Felix Ringo. This is an anthropologist. He has nothing to do with Esperanto. But he did his field work about anarchist groups in this town of Hoyesvete in Germany. So it was in the communist side of Germany. But he did his research after the end of the regime. <coughs> So basically, this city was uh, an industrial city, and after the end of communism, they didn't have money, they didn't have industries, and a lot of people there were unemployed. So actually, it's a hopeless city, if you could say so. So these people were doomed. They didn't have a future ahead. And some of the young uh, residents of the city decided to move to other places in Germany, and even abroad, to try to look for a better way of living, for looking for jobs, looking for opportunities. So, and there was a group of young, young anarchists in the city. And there was also, there is actually, a group of neo-Nazis in the city. And this guy was trying to approach the way these two groups relate to the future of Germany. So, he was the anthropologist. So, basically, he shows that the neo-Nazis wanted Germany to be a great country again, to be powerful to recover its power from the past and so on. And they were also trapped in these discourses between past and future. So this is not what he's saying, I'm just adapting my discourse to his research, basically. Uh, and then, <coughs> in the meantime, these anarchists, what did they do? They were organizing parties. They were getting together to talk about life, to experience different lifestyles, to experience new, new ways of like, getting dressed of thinking about the world and discussing politics. And many people were complaining. So these young people, they seem to be so happy, but there's nothing for them in the city. These young people, they seem to be nice, but they, in practice, they do nothing. Because they are just like throwing parties and gathering together for what? Because they're still unemployed. Because they, there's no future for them. There are no opportunities for them. And at least they, in their perspective of people in the city, at least the neo-Nazis, in a very contestable way, are trying to do something. They are trying to push forward the cause they defend. They are trying to make a difference. But these people, they are just having fun. They don't think about the consequences of their futures. They don't think about uh, working one day. So these people are weird. So the local population was against the anarchists, and some of them started to flirt with the neo-Nazis. Because these are the people who are trying to make the difference and to change something because these guys they just want to have fun <laughs> this is not a real social movement in this perspective so here this is Foyas Verde as you can see many abandoned buildings because many people moved from the city because they didn't find any opportunity there and then there's this amazing quote from Felix Ringo and in the end we can say we should not measure their achievement in regard to our own hopes for change or the emergence of new solutions so we keep uh, expecting that these people would have the same conceptions of hope in the future as we have. And when we project our mindset in their behavior, it seems to us that they are supporting a failed project, that there is no future for them and they are collapsing. But if we are going to carry out a real research with them, we can see that they hold different conceptions of hope of future. And they are not completely hopeless from their point of view. Maybe according to our point of view, but for them everything's okay. It's still worth fighting for this cause. And then going back to the Esperanto community. <coughs> so
So, uh, as I said, many young Esperanto speakers engage with Esperanto through these smartphone apps and online social networks. They don't go to associations. And then there's this structural gap in the Esperanto community. Because there are the older people who are in associations, usually they don't use internet regularly. They don't see how vibrant is the Esperanto community online, for example. And there's, there are these young people who don't care about associations and who are meeting elsewhere. And who get in touch with the other Esperanto speakers in a different environment. So basically, what about the adults, those between 30 and 60 years old? If there are older people in the associations and young people in the smartphone apps and online social networks, what about the others? So this, in this age group, between 30 and 60 years old, there aren't many active expertise if we think in these terms. Because usually, as I said, they are like, devoting their time to their family, to their career, they are working. So some of them see Esperanto as a pastime, so they don't have time for this anymore. And some others see it as a, Esperanto move, as a social movement, but in this age they don't really engage with social movements because they have other things to do. And in the meantime, we have these two age groups, the youngest and the oldest, it, and they don't often get in touch with each other. And then there's this sociologist, Jens Kibotro, and he describes age groups as structural forms. So basically, yeah. he's talking about childhood here. And then if we think about childhood, once we were children, and we, once we were part of this structural form, but then we grew older, nowadays we're not children anymore, but still this category of childhood still exists, because other people were born and replace us in this social category. So childhood will always exist despite the fact that the children at that time are not children anymore. So if we think about these terms here, these two uh, structural groups, like the young Sperm speakers and the old Sperm speakers can still exist, but in practice they are in different environments and the older ones are not always conscious about the existence of the young ones. <coughs> so the most immediate consequence of this structure we get is that <coughs> very often they hold different perspectives about the Esperanto movement, the community and the language itself. And even sometimes they use different expressions, they speak different, uh, Esperanto differently and this is a symptom of the lack of regular contact between them. And basically their views about Esperanto is always varies according to their positionality. Because if you are part of this institutionalizing movement, you don't see many things moving in the correct way. Because if you can't go abroad, if you can't travel, if you can't use Esperanto with someone from a different background, this language is not really useful for you. But still you want to promote it. But this promotion of Esperanto is like sprinting to stand still and they don't see much hope in it but people who are making a real use of Esperanto and being part of this Esperanto community that they call Esperanto they see how vibrant and how lively it can be and then Esperanto is something useful for them if we think about usefulness and uselessness in these terms <coughs> so basically one of my conclusions that I think is the most interesting part yeah. here about movements again, these two conceptions of movement as social movement and as circulation and travel. So the more <coughs> one has spatiality, the less temporality plays a role. Because if you, like, in terms of places, if you are trapped, if you only go to associations, if you don't travel, if you don't use Sperantic practice, temporality is central for you. Because you want to move Sperantic as a social movement, you want to refer to the glorious past, and you want to see this glorious quest again in the future and you keep promoting it and putting a real effort in it. But if you are not trapped in spatial terms, if you can travel, if you can really engage with this community, and then you don't really care about the future or the past. You know some things about the past of 
Esperanto as part of its history, let's say, but this doesn't really play a role in your everyday engagement with other Esperanto speakers. So, actually, these two possible ways of engaging with Esperanto kind of depends on these variations, these varieties. And <coughs> so that's basically what I had to say. And these are some references about this. So basically, it's, mm -hmm. the conclusion is, Esperantists may not be com completely happy about the progress of Esperanto, but it doesn't mean that they are usually hopeless, Charlie, because it depends on our perspectives of the concepts of hope, hope that are not necessarily the same they share. So these are some references, and thanks for coming. If you want to ask questions or complaints, feel free to do it. Thank you.